Hola, soy Paulina Feltrín. Y yo Valeria Benavides. Sentirnos bien se ha vuelto súper complicado. Así que aquí estamos nosotras para hacértelo fácil. Te invitamos a escuchar Ajá, el podcast en el que compartimos nuestros propios tips para vivir sanas y plenas. Mientras platicamos con las personalidades más relevantes en temas de salud y bienestar, quienes ofrecen consejos prácticos, recomendaciones sencillas y herramientas revolucionarias para inspirarte a encontrar respuestas. Decir Ajá es que nos caiga el 20. Te esperamos todos los martes y descubre tus Ajá Moments con nosotras. Welcome to a new episode of AHA. And well, let's begin with our great guest we have today, uh, because there is no longer any doubt that what we think affects our bodies. Countless scientific studies have shown this to be true. Today, we are honored and thrilled to have Dr. David Hamilton with us. He is a best-selling author and one of the greatest minds traveling the world, teaching how amazingly and profoundly the mind and body are connected. After completing his PhD in organic chemistry, Dr. David Hamilton worked in the pharmaceutical industry at one of the largest companies in the world, developing drugs for cardiovascular disease and cancer. Inspired by the placebo effect and how some people's condition would improve because they believe a placebo was real, the, he left the industry to write books and educate people on how they can harness their mind and emotions to improve their mental and physical health. It's been a long journey since then. He's now author of 11 books, and one that is coming up that he's going to tell us about, including the Amazon bestseller, The Five Side Effects of Kindness and How Your Mind Can Heal Your Body, which is a personal favorite of mine. And what Dr. Joe Dispenza describes at the book that will teach you that healing by thought alone is not only possible, but it is a reality. He's also a columnist, the Kindness Star for Psychologist magazine, and he has been a featured guest on Channel 4, Sunday Brunch Live in the UK, and CBS Sunday Morning in the US as well as in several BBC radio shows and podcasts around the world. He's also one of the contributors of the Heal documentary, where I came across his work and completely inspired me to understand how the placebo effect works and the power of the mind-body connection. Dr. Hamilton affirms that kindness is the opposite of stress, and therefore he's an advocate of kindness and works passionately to inspire a kinder world, with a great sense of humor, making science easy to digest and implement. The incredible Louis Haid once said about Dr. Ham, David has, a, has made a bridge that will be helpful to anyone seeking to understand the connection between our body, our mind, and our spiritual self. I cannot be happier to introduce you to Dr. David Hamilton, one of those fascinating scientists who is stretching the gap between science and the unique capacities that we have as of humans. And I like to think that he's also helping to stretch the gap between science and the divine. So thank you, David. It's an honor to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Paul. I'm very, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. It, it's, my, it's real, my, really my pleasure. I, I've been looking forward to to having this this conversation for for some time now. Thank you. Yes, we are very excited, and we're very happy to have you here, David. And um, we would like to start maybe for a, ba a very basic question, no? understanding a little bit more about you and how your path has been going. And can you tell us a little bit about your background? How is it that you came from the pharmaceutical industry to this new path in your life? You know, I, I can actually track it back to when I was a child, uh, when I, I was 11 years old and, and I went to high school, to secondary school, I remember being in the school library. And as odd as this might sound, a book fell off the shelf. I probably bumped it with my arm or something, I, I don't know. But the book was called The Magic Power of Your Mind. Now, I, by a, a gentleman called Walter Germain, now I picked it up and I thought, this will help my mum. And the reason I say that is because my mum had been suffering from postpartum depression. Uh, after, I have three sisters. And after my youngest sister was born in 1976, my mum suffered really really badly with postpartum depression and back in the 70s it wasn't very well understood so I mean one of the doctors actually said to my mum that she should give herself a shake you know asking a woman with postpartum depression to give herself a shake is like asking someone with a you know a broken ankle to just keep running you know so my mum struggled a lot and I felt real compassion for her so when I that book fell off the shelf I had an intuition that it could possibly help my mum. So I just put it in my bag and, and took it home. I didn't know that I'm supposed to borrow it from the library. I actually just, first time in a library, just 
we still have it. <laughs> but I gave it to my mum. Now it didn't it didn't cure my mum in one day, but it taught her like things like meditation and, and other uh, uh, positive affirmations and other strategies that helped her to, to perhaps navigate a course through some of the difficult times. And so one of the things my mum did a lot when I was young was relaxation, what we now call meditation. And she also used positive affirmations. And so I grew up in an environment as a young teenager, listening to my mum using positive affirmations and talking about the power of the mind and saying, it's all in the mind, I can do it. And, and so my mum and I would have these conversations about the power of the mind. And, and she was so believed that because she understood that it was her own determination that was helping her in some of the difficult days. So wind the clock forward and I had just, I had finished my PhD uh, and I was working with one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies and I was building drugs for, you know, a cardiovascular disease and for, for cancer. And when I started to see clinical data about the placebo effect, it was amazing to me. Now, my colleagues would be going, oh, look how well the drug is working. Ah, 75%. Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm looking at the placebo going, wow, how, why are all these people improving on a fake drug? So I, I began to research the mind-body connection uh, and understand it. And, it. and I couldn't believe that even back then in, in, the mid in, in the mid to late 90s, there was quite a lot of scientific research that had actually shown that believing something actually caused chemical changes in your brain. These chemical changes don't just happen by themselves. They happen because I might believe that a painkiller is going to make reduce my headache, even though it's a placebo. So I found this amazing. So I spent a lot of my free time while I worked in the industry, uh, understanding the mind-body connection. And after four years, I decided, you know, this is my passion. Now, I that there's enough people doing the job that I was doing. There's enough really talented scientists building medicines. I'm, be, I, I'm enthusiastic about education. So I'm better placed somewhere else. I just, well, I just decided to leave the industry and start writing books and giving lectures, really. And we thank you for that because we have learned so much from you. Thank and you. we have heard a lot about placebo recently, especially the last couple of years, because everybody's talking about vaccines and how it is tested again, placebo. But can you tell us what really placebo is? Right. So a placebo is, some people call it an empty pill, meaning it's an empty tablet. And what that means is there's nothing in it that has any pharmacological properties. There's nothing in it that can heal. It's just made of usually sugar or chalk dust with a couple of other things. It's, there's nothing in it, really. Uh, and the idea is, you know, 100 people get the drug and 100 people get the placebo. And, and we hope that the 100 who get the drug get better and no one improves who gets the placebo. But what happens is many people, and it, it varies depending on the type of condition, you know, and it varies depending on the trial, and it varies even from country to country. But on average, anywhere from 35, 50, 70% of people might respond favorably to a, a placebo. And what's really happening is the belief in what the person believes is going to happen actually causes a change in the brain so that the brain then produces the substances that it needs to produce to deliver what you believe. So for an, exa for an example, if I had a headache and someone, a doctor, gave me a, a tablet and reassured me that this little white pill will really take my pain away. And I really felt that the doctor's a very nice person and I believe them and I think, oh, thank you very much. I'm really grateful. And, and so I take this white tablet now, what I don't know is the doctor's given me a placebo, but I don't know that. But because I believe that that will take my pain away, my brain then manufactures morphine or its own version of morphine. So in your brain, you have the brain's natural version of morphine. It's called, morphine is an opiate drug. So your brain has its own opiates. They're called endogenous opiates. And the word endogenous just means that they belong to your own body. They're produced by your own self. So your brain, my brain would then produce endogenous opiates because I believe that my pain is going to go away. So the brain then say, the brain, oh, it's almost like the brain is saying, 
okay, David believes the pain will go away. So how do we make that happen? Oh, endogenous opiates. And it's like there's a little pharmacist who goes up to the shelf in the brain and says, okay, pain, 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 pain. Oh, endogenous opiates and pours that, sprinkles that around my brain. And then the pain goes away. But it goes away because I believed it would go away. And the belief itself produced endogenous opiates in the brain. So what underlies a placebo effect is that the brain produces what it needs to produce to deliver what you believe is supposed to happen. I love what you're saying because it means we can create our reality and we can create our life and we can base everything we're going to experience on what we are believing. And that's really inspiring. And of course, it, 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 it relieves everybody, no? It's like, oh, so good news. And it seems very easy, but um, I would love to know what about the other way around? What happens with the nocebo or what happens with the, uh, which I think it's more common, no? We are, we are all the way around believing that we are not going to heal, believing that we are going to become sick, believing that we are not going to uh, solve any problem. And, and what about it? Is, it? is it also the same? Does it work the same way? It works in the same way. It, so you, you have the, the opposite of the placebo effect is the nocebo effect. Now, it, the, the word placebo originally it's from a Latin word and it means I shall please, like I shall please you, I'll do something pleasing. Nocebo originates from I shall cause harm. So it, it's the opposite. Whereas I shall heal, I shall harm it kind of thing. So when a person believes that something this will cause me you know this this will not work for me for example so let's say I, I i was given the white tablet and instead of trusting the doctor and believing that this will work i decide you know what tablets medicine doesn't work for me i don't really believe in that and you know i don't really like that doctor for example then what the brain does then is it manufactures another substance that blocks the endogenous opiates and gives you the opposite effect. What actually happens sometimes is the pain can intensify. So what we often get is that the, a negative belief can generate through a very similar process, a, a, a negative set of, of symptoms. You know, so if where the placebo can generate positive consequences, the nocebo can generate negative consequences. How it works is, is very, very similar. You know, even with, even when a person takes a placebo but they don't know it's a placebo. Many people get side effects from placebos. And this is, this is caused by the nocebo effect. And here's the thing. They only get side effects if they know what the side effects are supposed to be. But if a person doesn't know what the side effects are, then they don't get them. Isn't that amazing? So knowledge of what the side effects are in some people triggers the nocebo effect. And then people from a placebo actually get some of these side effects. You find that the, it's called the side effect profile. You know, the, the number of things that, that you can get as adverse effects largely mirror those of the actual drug, people who get a placebo. But on if and only if they have some knowledge or awareness of what the side effects are, like if they've read the label, for example, and they go, oh, no, look at all those side effects. Then some people on placebos generate some of those side effects through the nocebo effect. Fascinating, isn't like, it? It's fascinating. And I like to touch on something that you mentioned a little before that it's how about words have an impact on us and how uh, a perception of someone else can actually impact our outcome. Uh, so many times I feel that doctors with the best intention, they just give us uh, diagnosis and then a prognosis and then in this prognosis sometimes we're talking about serious illness or chronic disease maybe cancer they give you a statistics about maybe your chance is 40 percent and instead of thinking yay 40 percent we are focused on well there's 60 percent chance that i'm not making it. Mm -hmm. maybe it's going to be very hard what is the impact of this trust and this confidence when yeah when prescribing no, I Deepak Chopra once said that we should accept a, a diagnosis, but we don't necessarily have to accept a prognosis, you know, like a statistical chance. Because when someone quotes 40%, that's a statistic that's averaged over everyone. And that, that type of statistic it kind of makes an assumption that everyone is the same. Everyone's not the same. Because in that 40%, that what I actually have is a bell curve where most people fit the same thing. 
but you've always got people at the top end who are living a lot longer, who, 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 who defeat the, the disease. And much of the time they're doing something differently. You know, maybe they're doing something different with their lifestyle. Maybe they're, they're managing their stress better. Maybe they're learning about nutrition. Maybe they're exercising more. Maybe they're doing other things in addition to what we normally do. So that 40% statistic doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. It's an average, but it can make everyone feel, like, believe that, oh, that applies to me. You know, but it does, and, and so for many people, then they generate the nocebo effect and they start to feel stressed and worried and anxious. I understand the other side of it because a doctor has to impress upon people the seriousness of the thing. But I, I think what's beginning to happen now is, is there's been much focus on empathy, doctor empathy, because lots of research just came out now showing that when a doctor has higher empathy, spends that little bit more time reassuring you and, and, and showing you that they, because most doctors genuinely care. I, I have some very good friends who are, who are medical doctors and they're really kind and gentle, thoughtful people. And, and they're very high in empathy. And research shows that when you really lean in and really show that you care for the patient, a few things happen. One, the patient is more likely to do what's good for them. And secondly, it actually can affect the patient's prognosis, the actual outcome of things. It can even affect their immune function. So people, for example, a study of over 700 patients who came in presenting with symptoms of the common cold, they were secretly asked to, to rate the doctor for the level of empathy. You know, those who gave the doctor the highest score, they recovered almost 50% faster than everyone else. And their immune response was almost 50% higher. And all the difference was, was some of the words and the language that the doctor used to reassure the patient that, you know what, even though this is my job, I really do care about you and I really, really want you to be well. Just giving that sort, sort of impression. I, I love this because it's true. It, it has to do with being compassive, being, being close, understanding the needs of the other, which is something that we all as patients want from our doctors. And it's not necessarily as common as it should be, you know? or as it was in the past when they had time for having a, a long conversation and, and they knew yeah. you and they were like the, the doctor of the family and they know everything about you and all the story. You know? so, so yes, I think one of the biggest things we, we, we really need now is those mm. kinds of words and, and, and approach. Yeah. And I think over a while, I think, sorry to interrupt, I, I, I think that science just hadn't realized, because I, I like what you said there uh, about, you know, Valeria, about when in the past, doctors would have much longer time to spend with people, but because, pop, you know, population increases and a lot of other things, that doctors only have small amount of time for patients. And I think for a, for a long time, science just forgot that empathy matters and they forgot that language makes a big difference and they forgot about the mind-body connection. It's only now that we're almost re-educating ourselves and realizing that all those things that we probably did 50 years ago that we've forgotten about, many of those things are actually really important and really, really important. And I, I love that science is beginning to shine a light on that now and show us about some of these mind-body effects, even the importance of empathy and kindness and compassion why these actually matter. I think it's great that we're understanding these kind of things now. Anyway, sorry yes. I interrupted no, you. No, no, no. No, it's interesting because those are the kinds of things that we're always thinking of now as patients. And when we are on the other side, Paulina and myself have, going, have been going through a lot of health issues in, in our past years. And of course, those are the things that come up to our minds all the time, no? Um, but you mentioned something that we want to talk about as well, which is the mind-body connection. And, 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 and to your point, you know, we also forgot then that it's part of, our, of, of who we are. Mm. You know, it, it, it's not something separate, it's part of who we are and that it's our mission and it's our task to really connect with our mind uh, through our body or vice versa, you no? Know? But can you tell us a little bit more about how this can benefit us and how can this really help us uh, if we are facing a health issue or we are facing any stress situation 
or any difficulty in life? Yeah, well, you know, I think we can use, we can harness techniques uh, like mental imagery. I call this visualization or using imagination. Uh, and the basis, I, I personally believe, having written lots of books on this subject and, uh, and stuff, I, I believe that visualization works a little bit like the placebo effect. I, I think what underlies the placebo effect and visualization is the same phenomena, the same uh, process. And, and what I mean by that, so a few moments ago, I said that when a person takes a placebo, and I gave the example of pain, then the brain produces what it needs to produce to deliver what the person believes is going to happen. But when a person does visualization, and it usually has to be repetitive, and I'll explain why that is in a minute, then I think the same thing happens, but the brain doesn't produce what it needs to produce uh, to deliver what the person believes is going to happen, but to deliver what the person is imagining is happening. But the, the process is the same. In both cases, the body responds to, in the, in the placebo effect, the body responds to belief and moves in the direction of belief. With visualization, the body responds to what you're imagining uh, and moves the brain, the body in that, that direction. And some of, the, some of the basis for this, and where I, I said it has to be repetitive, some of the basis of this comes from research that shows that if you repetitively imagine something, it actually causes physical change in the brain. One of my favorite studies actually was done at Harvard uh, University by a, a neurologist uh, by the name of, of Alvaro Pascal Leon. And he invited a group of volunteers to play a series of piano notes with each of their five fingers. So they, they basically went plunk, 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 up and down a scale, five notes, for two hours on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so five consecutive days. Now, they didn't do two hours nonstop. You, you plunk for a minute, then you shake your hand and rest for a minute, then you play for a minute, you shake your hand and rest for a minute, but you know what I mean, over a two-hour period. And they had their brain scanned every day. And Pascal Leon and his team uh, looked at the... They focused particularly on a region of the brain connected to the finger muscles. And it had grown like a muscle. Uh, and in fact, by the, the fifth day, that region was bigger and more active by a factor of about 30 to 40 times than it was on the Monday. But while each person did that with the fingers on the, the piano, a separate group of people closed their eyes, put their hands flat on a table with no piano and imagined that they were playing the notes. It, it, uh, it's called kinesthetic imagery, meaning you imagine what it feels like as if you really were moving your fingers. So imagine the feeling of going plunk, 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 but you're not moving your fingers, no movement at all, but just imagine how that feels. And they did that again, two hours on the, the five consecutive days. And amazingly, when they had their brain scanned each day and on the Friday, the same region of their brain had changed to the same degree, 30 to 40 fold as those who actually played the notes in the piano. And if you hold the two brain scans slide by, side by side, you can't actually tell the difference. In fact, do you want to see them? I've got them on my phone. I'll show you them. Let me yes, start. yes, share them, please. Give me a second. I forgot I had them on my phone, actually. Uh, I, took a, I took a screenshot. Let me find, let me find them. Oh, here we go. Yep, so I don't know if you can see that. So the top two rows there, that each box is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That fingerprint region uh, going from the small one to the large one is the region of the brain each day um, gaining in size. So the top two lines are those who played the notes with their fingers, but the mm -hmm. middle two lines are those who played the notes with their mind. And you can see that you can't actually tell the difference between who played the notes with their fingers and who played the notes with their mind. And they the look two, the same. They look the same. And the two lines in the oh, bottom yeah is the control group, that's the comparison group who don't do anything, just so that, like the placebo group, so that you can make a comparison. But isn't that amazing? That visualization yeah. of fingers moving had the same effect on the brain as actually moving. Yeah. Wow. So, so scientists around the world, especially in rehabilitation and sports, mm -hmm. uh, found this incredible. Uh, and so, you know, they started to experiment with it. And what we now know is many scientific studies have uh, taught people who've had a stroke and taught them how to use visualization. And so what they do is, let's say uh, a group of people have had a stroke 
and everyone gets you know a, a, a one month course of daily physiotherapy or physical therapy and at the and half of them at the end of the physical therapy session they get you know 30 minutes of just relaxation time the other half do 30 minutes of visualization and they have to visualize the the, the impaired part of the body actually moving. So if I had them, so if the person had impairment on the on that side, then they would imagine repetitively moving, let's say they would imagine, let's say, reaching for a bottle of water, lifting it, taking a drink, and putting it back down, reaching for the bottle, drinking, not actually doing that, but imagining it. They would imagine, you know, turning the pages of a book. They would imagine eating something, but moving that impaired side as if there was no impairment at all. And, and amazingly, what all of these studies show is at the end of the four, me the four weeks study, those who do the visualization recover much faster and much more within that time than those who get physiotherapy alone. So what you have is the, the, the power of physiotherapy and then the power of physiotherapy plus visualization is significantly stronger. And even in the world of sports, this has been harnessed. It, it began actually with a, a group at the, the Lerner Institute in Cleveland asked a group of volunteers to take their little finger and flex it, like extend and contract, you know, on and off for about 15 minutes. Uh, and they did that every day for, for 12 weeks. And at the beginning and the end, they put their finger in a machine and lifted a little set of weights to see how strong they were. And of course, they had all got stronger. In fact, after the 12 weeks, on average, the average improvement in strength was 53%. But the, another group of people, instead of doing that with the fingers, like the piano study, they put their hands flat on the table, closed their eyes, and imagined what it would feel like to do that. So no movement, just imagine the feelings and sensations. And amazingly, they all got stronger too. And the, the average improvement in strength was 35%. It wasn't quite as strong as 53, but it also wasn't zero. It was a 35% improvement in strength from having done absolutely nothing physical, but just all mental. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And I'm happy to say that after watching you at the Kill documentary, I started doing visualizations. And I can tell that I started doing it and I imagine taking out crumbs out of my body. And I remember trying like every day that I meditated and I was meditating like crazy because I was confined at the hospital and then at home. Mm. And I imagine removing the ulcers of my intestine. Every day I did it like for 40 minutes at least. And a month after when I came to do my study, they say they have never seen anyone that has healed their intestine in such quick time. Wow! And it was amazing because I really believe that it was me kind of giving the instructions to my body yeah. on top of everything else that I was doing and my doctors were doing on me. So I would like to touch base on how we are at the end all energy, you know, because I think when, whenever we are trying to make any changes in our health and without getting too uh, complex, um, touching very hard on quantum physics, but at the end, if we believe we are energy, it is easy to change or to modify than when we think we need to change something that is hard matter like, like a rock. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's a good way to think about it. So right now, uh, I'm sitting on a chair. I, I'm guessing that, that both of you are sitting on a chair. Yes. <laughs> although, we, although we have the, the sensation that I have a physical body and I'm sitting on a physical chair, when you go right down to the atomic scale, there's nothing physical there. In fact, the sensation arises from your bottom has about a million trillion trillion atoms. And each of those atoms is really just a, a nucleus of positive energy surrounded by a cloud of, of things called electrons. So what you really have is a little ball that's an electric field, just, ele just a, like a very, like, you know, if you take a magnet and you can feel the, something pulling towards it out to about that distance, and that's called the magnetic field, right? So you have an electric field around atoms. It's exactly the same. And so atoms have no physical component. They're just energy. So you have a positive little center, and then you have this electric field that surrounds it. So the million, trillion, trillion atoms in my bottom, my bum, uh, push against 
the million trillion trillion atoms on the chair. So what you actually have is electric fields pushing against electric fields. There is nothing physical. There's an electric field pushing against an electric field. The reason why you don't fall through the chair if it's just all energy is because the electric field of your bottom is balanced by the electric field of the chair. The brain processes this pushing as physical touch sensation, but there is no physical touch. In fact, there is no physical brain. It's all electric fields interacting with other electric fields. Now, a lot of philosophers even suggest that what lies underneath the electric fields is consciousness itself. And so what actually is the organizing structure of all matter and fields in the world is consciousness. And that, that's a line of philosophy called idealism. And it's very similar to another type called panpsychism, which believes that all matter has some sort of a degree of, of conscious experience, albeit different from, from our own. But certainly in idealism, which mirrors the philosophy in, in the East of non-duality, suggests that the world itself, all the, the particles and matter and fields are really just uh, appearances of consciousness. And, and therefore what really organizes and governs the movements and large scale effects is consciousness itself. So, uh, so I, 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 some, I often reflect on that as a, to give me a sense, a, you know, a feeling of, of empowerment that if my consciousness, if all, everything is consciousness, then perhaps we have more power than we, than we have led ourselves to believe. Yes, and, and you're talking about the power of words, the power of energy, mm -hmm. no? the power of our mind focusing on, on what it has to help in our body, which is not what we see to your point, no, it's different. Mm -hmm. But can you tell us a little bit more on, on what the positive effect and thinking about energy and about thoughts and about these things we cannot really touch. What about hope? What about um, positive thinking? No, you talked about visualization, which is really important for uh, generating that image that should happen if we are constant and repetitive on that image. But what about uh, these kind of feelings, hope, but also this positive thinking, this confidence? Yeah. Um, how does it affect also these processes in our mind? So I, I think they're very, very important, very powerful, because in the past, we, as we started to consider the mind-body effects, we would always think that hope and positive intentions, that the, all they were really doing was reducing stress. And so we tried to write them off and say, oh, well, it's really just the reduction in stress. But what we're learning now is that's not the case at all. In fact, thoughts themselves, and meaning the direction that we place, we point our mind, you know, whether you're thinking of this thing or that thing or something else, actually begins to influence what happens in, inside the body. In a very simple way, if I was to think of someone who causes me stress, then that thought itself might generate stress hormones in my brain and body, adrenaline, cortisol, these kind of things. But if I point my mind in a different direction and I was to think of someone I care about and maybe think of some of the reasons why I, I really appreciate a person in my life, then my brain and body will produce what I call kindness hormones uh, that are responding to that, how that, those thoughts of kindness feel. I call them kindness hormones to draw a parallel with, with stress that they're produced because of where your mind is and produced because of how something, something feels. So hope doesn't just reduce stress. I believe hope itself produces some beneficial substances in the body that are that actually vary depending on what someone's hoping for. And I think positive attitude and positive thinking also produce specific things because science is now showing that rather than just reducing stress, some states of consciousness can actually cause a substantial elevation of the immune system. So I believe that visualization, in fact, you know, visualization itself can actually increase immune function or it can decrease immune function, depending upon what the person is visualizing, depending on, upon what the person needs. The immune system will respond one way or another way, depending. You know, for, I mean, the research now shows that mind-body states, learned mind-body states can actually 
increase immune function or, or, or decrease them. It depends what, what the mind is actually doing. You know, so, so I, I think when a person visualizes, like Paulina, when you visualized your improvement, it wasn't just that that was reducing stress in your body. It was your mind itself and, and the images and the hope and the intentions that you had, I believe, was actually causing a change in the way your immune system was working. Yeah, uh, so that your immune system was working more intelligently, doing more of what it, because of what you were imagining is happening, your body was beginning to, over time, beginning to learn and respond to the images that you were generating so that your immune system was saying, okay, what do I have to do now? So I think a lot of the time, it's the immune system that's responding to visualization and other you know, systems in the body as well. But in large part, I think the immune system is become almost becomes more intelligent it starts re responding more intelligently in line with what you're imagining is is happening so I, I i i say i really believe that what you were doing had a huge effect in your healing thank you i like to think that too <laughs> and yeah. i think what you're saying is giving us a lot of power back to us because it really talks about how we have some control over our immune system and how we are responding to illness, but not only to illness, to every situation that happens in our lives. We have the power to choose how we're gonna react if we are care careful enough to pay attention to what we're feeling. And I remember I took your online course that is the biology and contagious of kindness. And I was amazed to realize that I was kinder than I was actually thinking. And it made me feel happier and during those four weeks, it was really a good exercise. But can you touch base on why you believe that kindness, which is not something very common in these days, unfortunately, uh, it's really the opposite of a stress? And how many hormones, these hormones that you're talking about, can really help us in our health, in our mental health, in staying young? How does it yeah. work? Okay, so I often, I, sometimes when I'm, giving a presentation to a live audience i i would i or ask the audience to to shout out i say what is the opposite of stress and you know almost everyone responds with peace or calm or tranquility but those actually represent not the opposite of stress but the absence of stress physiologically speaking and neurologically the opposite of stress is kindness or it's how kindness feels because when a person feel stressed, it's not a, a situation that a person finds himself in that causes uh, the brain to make stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. It, it's not very little to do with the situation because two people can be in the same situation. One person feels stressed and one person doesn't. The person who feels stressed will have stress hormones produced. The person who doesn't feel stressed will not. So therefore the situation doesn't matter all that much it's how you feel so it's feelings of stress that produce stress hormones when when a person does something kind because of how that feels they generate kindness hormones and i said earlier i call them kindness hormones to draw this parallel with how they're produced uh, and and the main kindness hormone actually is oxytocin it's the re female reproductive hormone but it also plays a large part in in your cardiovascular health it also plays a role in digestion. It even plays a role in wound healing and even muscle regeneration after injury or illness. It has very, very many roles in the body. It's actually, it's now called cardioprotective. It plays such a big protective role uh, for the heart. There's, there's other kindness hormones. One is nitric oxide. It's not really a hormone, but I still call it a, 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 horm a kindness hormone to keep things simple, you know, keep science a bit simple. But anyway, but what these kindness hormones do is in many ways, the exact opposite of what stress hormones does. So when you feel stressed, what generally happens is blood pressure goes up. But when a person's being kind because of how it feels and generates kindness hormones, kindness hormones themselves lower blood pressure. And they do it by actually, they, they actually, they, they, they park like little, little uh, vehicles. They park on the lining of blood vessels and cause the blood vessels to, to release the tension and expand. So the heart doesn't have to push to, as hard to get the blood through. So the heart eases off some pressure and what you get is a reduction in blood pressure. So kindness hormones are 
cardio protective, they lower blood pressure, just like stress hormones increase blood pressure. And so any way of producing kindness hormones is also cardio protective. So kindness is cardio protective. Hugging is cardio protective. Showing empathy and compassion. Being a nice person, meaning it, being genuinely nice is also cardio protective. So, so I, I love how this happens because it's the feeling and it shows that our bodies are wired, genetically wired, biologically wired to actually to respond to kindness. It's like nature is saying, yes, more of this, please keep doing this. Mm. I love it. I love it. And David, I, I imagine you have been testing in yourself as well. All this that you have been teaching us you know, throughout your books and throughout your, your whole experience. Is there any experience, any personal situation that you have been facing um, implementing visualization, implementing kindness in your life? Can you share any personal yeah. experience? Uh, most of my personal experience actually comes from uh, muscle strains uh, gained through, te uh, through tennis. I, I live in a town in central Scotland that's very famous for tennis because the former world number one tennis player, singles and doubles player brothers grew up in, in Dunblane. So Andy Murray and Jamie Murray both grew up in Dunblane. So tennis in, in this town of Dunblane is very, very, it's a big, big deal. So I started playing tennis about five years, four or five years ago, having, when I was in my mid, -fifth, mid 40s, having never played tennis in my entire life before. And, and I decided, I remember I decided that after realizing it's quite scientific, you're learning all these different ways of moving and holding the racket. I thought, I want to get better. And I'd been playing in the club leagues, the league system, you know, you have league one, two, three, four, there's nine divisions now. There used to be four, there's now nine. And, uh, and I was, for about a year, I was the second worst tennis player in Dunblane, <laughs> according to the league structure. And I decided I was going to do a one month, a four week experiment where I would visualize doing the tennis serve. And because I, I figured that it, most people you play against can serve quite well. And if, you, and if you can't serve very well, then you always lose. And I thought I, I lose, my average losing margin was six love, six one on average. I, I, I'd know I had won a single set of tennis in one year. And I thought, well, I, I want to learn. So I decided to visualize every day. I would visualize 10 serves that way and 10 serves that way. And after a few days, I found it quite difficult because the way visualization works is you need to, you need to know what you're visualizing. It's called mental representation. You need to have a mental representation, something that will represent or symbolize what you want to happen. But with mechanical movements like tennis, I didn't really know what a proper serve looked like because I'd never really done one. So I got a video of Andy Murray, the tennis player, the Scottish tennis player, uh, and I watched it a thousand times doing a serve. I, I thought a hundred times a day on loop for, sorry, I watched it 3,000 times, 100 times a day on loop for 30 days to wire into my brain what it looked like, what a, a tennis serve looked like, so that I had the visual image. And then every day for the next month, I visualized playing, doing the serve. Anyway, I, I, I pl the league started a month later and I won the division. I won the league. <laughs> My tennis improved so much wow. by just learning how, how to serve. And, and since then, because I've got a little bit better, I hit the ball a lot harder. I picked up a few muscle injuries and strains. So I use visualization to, to, to speed up the repair, speed up the, the injury rehabilitation. So I've done that several times over the last four or five years. It's mostly what I use personally visualization for is just to speed up rehabilitation, speed up injury repair. You know, it doesn't mean that I'll, I'll heal in one day, but let's say an injury would take two weeks. I'm hoping I can do it in 10, you know, five or 10 days kind of thing. That's what I'm looking for in my mind. So that's the kind of improvement that I, I, I've noticed through visualization. It's fascinating because it's, really doing the extra of whatever what all the other things that you need to do like you need to go yeah. to therapy you have yeah. to do it but if you're visualizing as it's well. gonna improve exactly it's it's on top of everything yeah. uh and what i like about what you're talking david is that it really creates 
physiological and biological changes in our body. It's not something woo-woo that we believe that the mind is doing and has no effects. Yeah. Uh, for all the people that are listening, if there's one takeaway that they could take from this talk and they can start harnessing the mind-body connection, what would it be? You know, what, what I would actually say is spend time every day thinking kind, thinking kindness. You know, it, it, it's probably one of the healthiest things you could do for your overall mental and physical health. You know, research shows that that regularly thinking kindness because of how it feels, you know, I'm thinking of people in your life that you care about and all the reasons why you appreciate the person or even thinking of experiences you've had with kindness, whether you're the giver of the kindness or the receiver of the kindness, or even the witness to the kindness. But research shows that actually causes physical change in this frontal part of the brain with a slight bias to the left-hand side, which is the re regions of the brain associated with happiness and positive emotion and, and joy and, and even spiritual states of consciousness. And so the way kindness feels is actually causing a physical change in the brain. At the same time, kindness hormones turn down the activity of a stress and worry and fear center of the brain. Just like you might take, turn the dimmer switch down to reduce the intensity of a light, you can turn down the intensity of that region in the brain by just feeling how kindness feels. And at the same time, you're benefiting your cardiovascular system, you're making your heart and your, also the immune system healthier. So probably the simplest and most productive state of consciousness I think we could have is to hold feelings of kindness in our hearts and minds, even for just a small amount of time, a small amount of time every single day. That's what I would, that would be the best piece of advice I could give. Rather than waiting until we're sick and then using visualization, one of the best protective things we could do is actually start visualizing kindness, thinking and feeling kindness. Yes, what I, what I love to practice is this gratitude, no? And, and and, and be thankful for things that maybe they have not even happened, no? But it's like, okay, let's, let's be thankful for all these blessings, for all this abundance, for all, and, and at least that's, I assume this can be considered as part of kindness, right, no, as well. Yeah. Um, David, what about uh, your thoughts around typical drugs, medicine, no, regular, the regular way we treat most of our illnesses uh, nowadays. What do you think about it? How do we combine them with all this or what's your posture around it? Uh, I, you know, I am a great believer in integrated medicine or integrative medicine where you take the best of the West and the best of the rest and you put it all together. So I, I, I very much believe in a fusion of complementary and, and mainstream practices. Sometimes the mainstream thing is the most, is the thing that we need most for very acute situations. But other times a complementary approach might actually produce more value. You know, there's a growing, you know, in the UK, we have the, the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. There's something very similar in the US. There's a relatively new organization of, of medical doctors who are learning to prescribe lifestyle changes before they prescribe uh, med physical drugs and medicine. And because, you know, I have a few friends that would say that, that maybe 75% of people coming into the clinic are presenting with lifestyle related illnesses and diseases that are reversible and that are preventable, preventative. So what they do when some people come into the surgery, rather than saying, I'm going to put you on this medicine, they say, could we have a little bit of time and maybe make, try this lifestyle change first? And if you can make this change first, we might not need to go down the line of medicine. It doesn't mean that for some people the medicine isn't necessary, because for some people it is, but for some other people it's not. And I think we're beginning to learn that everyone's different and maybe there are a lot of lifestyle and visualization, meditative practice. I mean, th there's... These lifestyle doctors, what they do, they, they look at people's lifestyle. What foods do you eat? How much activity do you get? How's your sleep? How's your stress levels? What's your sense of community? How, how well do you, what's your relationships like? And how well do you interact with people? Because these five pillars 
are so incredibly important. And if we look after these five things, many times we might not even have an illness in the first place. We might actually protect ourselves from, a, from getting some things. So, so I very much believe a fusion of both complementary and, and mainstream. Sometimes one, more of one and less of the other, but other times more of the other and less of the one. And it just depends on the person and it depends on, on the situation. There's no real, uh, a single black and white answer for everything. I think that there's some middle ground that I think we need to find and we are beginning to find it now. So I, I think, I mean, I worked in research and development, so I, I know the value for it. I worked in cardiovascular and cancer. I, I know the value of some of these very potent drugs for people who really need them. But I think also for many other people, there's significant lifestyle changes that might reduce how much a person needs and to take and also might eliminate the need altogether or even prevent a person even generating an illness and disease in the first place. So I think we're just beginning to learn uh, or remember perhaps uh, some of these some of these things. Yes, I, I love it. And, and um, I would say that in my past years, which is something that I invite every everybody to, to do, is that I have been understanding when I feel bad for something, you know, when I feel I'm kind of sick. Now I, I have the ability of knowing that mix, you know, when I have to go to the doctor or when I have to really get some sleep or when I have to really get on a specific diet, you no, know, and, 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 and the thing is, everybody's like, or to your point or black or white, but the truth is we can come, you know, we can combine and we can try to find out the best mix depending on our needs, on, on what we feel. And that's more or less what I have been doing in the past years. And, um, and it works perfectly well for me. So I think I, I love what you say that, that we cannot be on one side or the other, but let's test everything and the best of the rest and of all, no? Yeah, the best of the West and the best of the rest. <laughs> I just thought that up. <laughs> I love, I love it. it. I love it. It just came to yeah. me. Yeah. And I think it's, as you said, there's no magic pill. And so many times I have come across people that just hate medications and the other just want to go on the other side. And I think it's maybe you can take off medication like you're saying, but what else you're doing to get there? You know, what yeah. else that you are helping your body to create that medicine that you were mentioning, maybe in the placebo effect, right? You so, know, I, should, you know, some, I, I, I have occasionally given lectures in cancer centers, and these are usually run by charities for people who are going through cancer treatment, but they come to the charities for complementary treatments as well. So like Reiki, you know, massage, healing techniques. I teach the mind-body connection, visualization. And, and a lot of people have, you know, have a, a lot of people who are patients who come to the talks are receiving chemotherapy, but some of them are very stressed about it because they believe that what they're taking into their body is a poison. Mm -hmm. So what I say to them, if you believe it's a poison, then you're going to feel stress and that stress isn't going to help. So what if instead of thinking of it as a poison, why don't you visualize the chemotherapy drugs as little smiling faces, but with big teeth and imagine them eating the tumors? and destroying the tumor. So instead of seeing it as a poison, see them as little smiling faces with large piranha fish teeth going, and imagine the tumor getting eaten away. And so the cancer is getting smaller and smaller because there's research, fairly recent research published in a, a medical journal called The Breast, women with breast cancer who were asked to visualize their immune systems like piranha fish eating cancer cells. And their immune system became much stronger, much more robust than those women who weren't doing the visualizations. So I, I, I believe that when, instead of visualizing, imagining, oh, this is a poison, we change the mindset a bit. If you have to take it, then change the mindset. It's not a poison. These are little smiley faces. Rebrand it in your mind as mm -hmm. smiley face characters who are trying to help. They have big teeth, but they're using that big teeth to eat cancer and to destroy the tumor. And I think that might well increase a person's immune function. And it might help them rather than visualize, rather than thinking of it as poison and creating stress. So we're doing the, we can use visualization therefore to change how we picture a medicine if we have to take a medicine. 
then we can visualize the medicine as something positive doing what it's supposed to do. You know, I, I was talking a year ago to a radio producer and it was, we, we chatted for five minutes before a live radio. And she was telling me that she had a childhood rheumatoid arthritis and in, in children, it can be very, very painful. And a nurse once told her she was about to take her medication. She was crying with the pain. And the nurse said to me, said to her, see this little thing, we dissolved it in the water. See all those little particles. Now imagine they're all little smiley faces and you're drinking them. And then imagine them going into the body and then moving right along the arm, right to where you're feeling the pain. And imagine them just moving into that area and, and causing everything to relax and settle down. First time she did that, the pain went away in seconds. Even though we know from placebo effects that pain takes a little bit longer, but it, it went away. She's been doing that repetitively. And when I, she interviewed, when she, I chatted to her, she was 28 years old. She'd been doing it for over 20 years. And she said, I know that, you know, painkillers don't work that fast, but I swear it, the moment I take a painkiller, the pain just goes away, right away, because she's trained her brain circuits to generate what it needs to produce by visualizing these painkillers, dissolving it, lots of little smiley faces, going into the body, moving up, up the arms to the fingers and other parts of the body and instantaneously taking the pain away. So, uh, so we can, we, we can re-perceive, we can rebrand in our minds. If we have to take medicine, then we can change, rather than feeling stress about it, we can turn the image around and see it doing what it's supposed to do. And that's part for me of a fusion between the best of the West and the best of the rest. We're using everything together. Yes, and, and, and I recall as well, and to your, to your point on sharing breast cancer, I'm also a breast cancer survivor, and I was not conscious about, it, of, about being visualization, but I, but I remember that um, before every chemotherapy, I did like a small ritual. You know? I, I, and now I know it was visualization, but at that point I just said, I just have to tell my body that this medicine will only affect the cancer cells. So I took about five or 10 minutes before starting the chemotherapy with a, right. a little bit of, you know, breathing, um, a little bit of meditation, but, but telling also my body like, okay, this medicine that's going to come, it will only affect my cancer cells, but anything else, no? And, um, and, 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 and it was, I mean, it was a very nice process, no? Even though even though I was very nervous about the medicine throughout the months and weeks, the truth is, is, is I was doing visualization without knowing it. Yeah. You know, I, 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 a few years ago in the UK, a consultant gynecologist came to one of my, 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 my talks because he came out of curiosity because he, he told me at the end that a number of his patients who were going, taking chemotherapy and other treatments had almost an absence of side effects or a very low number of side effects compared to everyone else. And when he started, he asked a few of them, he said, some of them would, would say, oh, I read this book called How Your Mind Can Heal Your Body by David Hamilton. Uh, and they said, after hearing, after hearing the book and, after, and having it shoved in my face once or twice, I decided to find out a bit more. So I came along to, to the talk uh, and he said he found it fascinating because when he asked some of the patients, they did something very similar. Right before they got the, the chemotherapy, they visualized this, won't, this is not doing me any harm. This is actually doing something good. And they set that intention. And so they visualized during the process, the little smiley faces going in and chewing up, but only touching the cancer and leaving everything else alone. And, and so he said he was so curious because through all his medical training, he'd never learned anything about the mind-body connection. So he was curious. So he came along to the lecture just so that he could hear for the first time in his medical career how the mind-body connection works. You know, fascinating. So I really believe that what you did would have helped a lot, given what other people, the success other people have had doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating the power of our mind and yeah. how it can really help us heal. I mean, sometimes heal us completely. It's, mm. it's fascinating. 
Uh, we want to be very respectful of your time, David. So we like to close every episode asking this question, and it is, can you share an aha moment? Can I share? An aha moment. An right? aha moment? Yeah. Oh, an aha moment. That, that's happened for me. Yes. Something that's happened for me. A, I would say... Oh, maybe when I really understood how kindness really does affect a person's not not just mental health but physical health. I think for me that was a wow. That is that for me was a game changer. The moment I really understood by reading some scientific papers, I really understood it was a wow. This kindness can change the world. I mean, it really can. Mm -hmm. Just being kind to each other. Wow, what a, what a thought. That really can change the world. It's fascinating. And yeah. I would like to invite everybody listening to us to go to his website, drdavidhamilton.com, and please subscribe to The Biology and Contagionness of Kindness. It's four weeks that can change your life. And it's and free. Just, and it's free, of course. And as you said, kindness can change the world and kindness can change your life. And kindness is contagious. It's even more contagious than some disease. Is that right? Yeah. In fact, kindness is the, of all the scientific research papers I've ever read, which is thousands, kindness is the most contagious of all things. It has the highest R number. You know, R number, when we talk about the coronavirus, R number means reprodu reproducibility rate. It means how infectious something is. So the higher the number, the more infectious something is. Do you know kindness has an R number of somewhere between four and five? Uh, and what that means, it, you know, in fact, and it also goes out, it, it, it moves outwards to what's called three social steps. I'll give you an example. So researchers at Harvard and Yale found that kindness goes out to what's called three social steps. So if you be kind to someone, then because of how you made that person feel, that person will then be kind to someone else. Now, that someone else is at one social step from you. But that someone else, because of how they now feel, will then be kind to someone else. But that someone else is now two social steps away from you. But that someone else will then be kind to someone else who's now at three social steps from you. And that third person, you'll probably never meet them in your life. But mm -hmm. they're receiving an act of kindness because of how you made the first person feel. But here's the thing. What, because kindness has an R number between four and five, and it varies depending on culture, interaction rate, all these things. But let's, let's use the number five. It means that if you be kind to one person, you do something kind today, then what you don't see is how, if you followed the person around for the rest of the day, what you would see is that person, because of how you made them feel, would likely be kind or kinder to five people. That's what the R number of five means, because of how you made them feel. But that's only at one social step. If you were to follow those five people around, let's say you had a wee network of drones and you followed them all around, then you would find that each of those five people will also in turn also be kind or kinder to five people at two social steps. So now we have 25, but that's only at two social steps. If you had this swarm of drones and followed everyone around and videoed them all, each of those 25 would also be kind or kinder to five people. And what you actually have from that one act of kindness is a ripple effect where 125 people are receiving wow. an act of kindness. It's like if you drop a pebble in a pond, a stone in a pond, and it goes plop, and it creates a little wave. At the other end of the, the pond, a lily pad's doing this. And it doesn't know why it's doing that. But it's doing that because of the wave. And what set the wave in motion was the, the stone, the pebble dropped in the pond. Now, the pebble in the pond is a metaphor for an act of kindness that you drop into human society. And it's not lily pads that are being lifted, but people's spirits and their hopes and dreams. People are receiving a lift from one thing that you said or one thing that you do. And, I, you know, I, I think many people in the world sometimes feel that unimportant, that like I don't matter, what I do has no value. And I'm, I, what I'm trying to say is you're, you're making a difference in the world every single time you say something nice and you mean it. Every single time you do something kind and you mean it, 
you're dropping a pebble in the pond and you're literally impacting all these people several times a day, every single day. So that's fantastic. And we challenge everybody listening yes. or watching us to do at least one act of kindness today. Wonderful. Well done. Thank you, David. If someone wants to follow, if someone wants to read your books, how can they find you? It, well, everything for me is on my website, drdavidhamilton.com. You can find links to my blogs, my books, my courses, my online courses. I run a monthly live Zoom talk called Personal Development Club. You can see about that on my site. Uh, I also have all my social media links on my website as well. So there, there's lots of, there's 120 free blogs on there, you, articles covering all this kind of stuff you can read about as well. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your time, for you. all your knowledge and for sharing, for sharing your time, of course. Thank you, David. It was great it's meeting my, you. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me onto this podcast. It's been really, I, I've really enjoyed uh, having a conversation with you both today. So thank you so much from, from me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.